and welcome to NARC Live on Thursday. Thursday? Thursday. Thursday, the 29th of July, 2021, coming to you live from Norfolk on the east coast of England with Tammy M0TC. Hello. And me, David G7URP. Sorry, my microphone's on the desk, so oh, I'll put it on in a sec. Oh, right. Okay, well, I'm sure we'll hear what you said. <laughs> Let's have a look. What's on tonight's show? Jim Bacon shows us when, where, and who to work on the air using his PropQuest web tool. We have club news and your pictures. And we find out who works from a shack like this. Now, despite last night, which if you've watched, you'll know that we had to come off the air quick and we'll talk about that in a minute. But we didn't, we've only still got one entry for this. So who do you think works from a shack like this? If you think you know, and there is a really big plug in there for the who's work, who's shack that is on, on that picture. Have a good look now and then enter it on Facebook or on BATC and then we'll read your entry out with the other one later in the programme. But first, it's good to see you and let me listen. We haven't got that. I thought that was noise. your tummy. That was. No, I've eaten tonight. We had time to eat tonight because we didn't have to rehearse. Anyway, um, yes, this time last night. Um, if you didn't happen to join us last night, um, you know, we had a, quite a storm going on outside. That didn't bother us in itself, but we did have a power glitch, which, went up, which came back fairly quickly. We were able to get back on air, but then we had a bad power glitch, and actually that lasted for over an hour for us, so we had no power. And whilst our computers and things were all safe, and we were safe, we haven't got enough power and backup power to run all the studio lights and everything else. So that's why we had to come off on air, and thank you very much for joining us tonight on the Thursday. If you're watching this on a recording, of course, doesn't really matter. No, it doesn't. No, like, what's going on? <laughs> it's our first Snark Live on a Thursday. Anyway, we thought, as well as doing everything that we were going to do last night, we would just give you the opportunity to send any pictures or anything of the storm if it happened near you. And I'm glad to say that we did get some pictures. This we is did. from John 20TWQ, who lives in Great Yarmouth. Wow. Now, that doesn't exactly look friendly to me, <laughs> although I know a man who could tell us a bit more about it. And there's a picture there. Still some gulls around there. Yeah, they're not <clears> worried, <throat> are they? Ooh. Look at that. What do they talk about? Will's mother, innit? Yeah. Look a bit dark over Will's mother. Back over Will's mother's. Looking that doesn't good, look hey? too good either. Now this this one's my favourite picture. <gasps> look at that. Oh yes. That's good, isn't it? That moved. We 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 had to blow it away actually from this area in yep. uh, near Attleborough <laughs> in Norfolk right up to the coast at Great Yarmouth. And then we saw it disappear. Yeah. Uh, just to give you a flavour, I know you don't want us to share all our weather pictures with you, but have a look at this video, which we took just out of our building, outside the front of our building here. Have a look at this. Now you can see, if you look, that's just gravel, and it's pretty well, you know, normally that obviously the water just goes through the gravel, but if you have a look carefully, you can see it mm. had really flooded that, so quite bad, I think you'd say. One more picture here. But, but this picture, yeah. we're proud of this, aren't we? Yeah, when we went home... <laughs> We walked home early when we realised we couldn't come on air again. And this is what we saw. Look at that. And it's not just one, because if you have a careful look at that and look above the main one, there's another one. And I don't think I've seen one quite like that ever myself. Not a full double. And that's the back of our building mm. here. Well, I don't know about you. I know we know vaguely probably how a lot of you will know how um, rainbows are formed. But we have happened to have a man with us who could tell us a bit more. So let's now welcome, slightly earlier than planned, originally, Jim Bacon, G3YLA. Jim. Hi, David. Hi, Tammy. Good to see you. So, mate, um, I wish now, by the way, I'd have booked you, though, for a talk about weather forecasting rather than propagation forecasting, because then we might, might have been aware, prepared last <laughs> night. But anyway, thank you for joining us tonight. And I know we're going to be talking about PropQuest and things later on. But can you just tell us a little bit more about that picture? If we put that picture up again, Tammy, just tell us how that is formed. And particularly, how has a double rainbow formed? Well, well the, the essence of rainbows is that they typically happen when an area of rain clears through and the sky is uh, a broken enough cloud where the sun is to let the sun shine through into the rain area. Um, now, normally with weather systems like fronts and stuff, it, the cloud covers the whole sky and you very rarely get that opportunity. But with showery conditions, you often get rain clearing uh, on one side of the sky and the sun coming out on the other. 
and and typically when it's uh, later in the day and the sun is a bit lower you get the angles just right you can get these wonderful effects and rainbows are just where the sun's light passes from the sun through the raindrop and gets internally reflected within the raindrop from the inside of it and split into its composite col colors so so the the raindrop um, air interface acts like a prism. So you get this, this prism effect, it goes in, it's internally reflected from the inside surface and comes back out again. And in some cases where it's particularly strong, there's enough energy to be reflected again. So it goes through twice and, and you get your double rainbow. So, so it takes a particularly strong bit of sunshine to achieve that effect and raindrops of sufficient uh, quantity, you know, some that just a drop here and there, you, know, you wouldn't mm. you wouldn't get that necessarily. And the other thing you notice with rainbows in showery weather, when you tend to see them more often, is that you tend to get a slightly brighter bit of sky underneath the arc of the rainbow, and that's also to do with the optical effect of how the light is distributed when it comes out. So uh, it's fairly common in showery weather. What is very uncommon, and, and we're not talking about that in this instance, but if you ever get a chance to see these, do try and find a moon bow. <laughs> because oh. the, a, a rainbow at night, due to the effects of the same same physics, but, but with the reflected sunlight from the moon, so the moon's light goes into the raindrop and does all the same things. That's the most wonderful sort of ethereal look to it. It's the most incredible thing. And I remember seeing that a few times in the winter when you can get showers at night in the winter around our coasts and that was when I was working on airfields and I had to go out every hour through a night shift to observe the weather and make notes and things and and I did I was lucky enough to see two during during quite a few years when I was doing that job so uh, that's something really special if you see that. So I guess you're looking then as well you'd, you'd hope to have a clearish skies to be able to, for the moonlight the full moonlight to come through but to have clouds over the area where, and, and rain indeed happening yeah. over the area where you can see this um, moonbow. I've never heard of a moonbow. No, I've Can never heard of it, no. Well, well, in actual fact, in this part of, of Britain with the winter pattern like that, because normally showers are, how should we say, they're daytime things. So the heating of the ground makes the air rise, forms a shower, and you get the thunderstorms and all the rest of the mayhem, and that's when you also get your rainbows. But in the winter, it's the relatively warm seas around the country that produce the showers and they keep going day and night simply because the sea doesn't change its temperature very quickly it stays roughly the same from the day through to the night very small change so so you can get in a winter northerly you can get these big showers running down the north sea maybe on some occasions if it's cold enough there'll be a snow but quite often there are rain and you'll see them on the northern horizon uh, over North Norfolk and where they come inland and you've got a strong moonlight, then you can sometimes get exactly the same effect. You can get a moon bow. Wow, that's fantastic. Well, look at that. Twice the put, value. Put that on the bucket list. We have, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> we will. Thank you very much, Jim, for joining us slightly earlier on this. And once again, thank you very much for coming back tonight anyway to do the talk. We'll be seeing you a bit later on for Prop Quest. But uh, thank you very much to Jim there. And thanks again to all of you for joining us. But let's get back to, so some of this we did do last night, but for those of you just watching this for the first time, this will be the recording that we keep. And so we're gonna go through everything again. It won't take too long. Firstly, let's tell you about what's happening this Sunday, the 1st of August. It's the Kings Lynn Amateur Radio Club Radio Rally. There we are, it's their 31st. Um, and that's at the Gaywood Community Centre off Gayton Road in Kings Lynn. Uh, the gate opens at nine. There's the details on there. You can see how much the pitches are and everything else. And that, that pic picture is also on our website if you want to get that. And contact details and everything are there. The only thing we'd like to add is that a couple of us, um, Kevin and myself, and possibly Mark G. Zero DJ, are going there just to help them marshal the cars in the first hour or so because that's when they need a bit of help. They were brilliant because they sent four or five people to the Barford event that we did and helped us. So we thought it'd be nice to help them return. So if you're going to that anyway, or maybe you live in the area and you're willing to give an hour or two, that's all, just to help us park some cars and you've got a fluorescent jacket ideally, although we can give you that if you haven't, then maybe we can meet you there. Just drop me an email and then we'll, we'll get in touch with Mike, um, one of the organizers there at the Kings Lynn rally. But I hope that goes well and we'll see some of you, I guess, there. Mm. Thank you. 
<coughs> Next, we've got some pictures that Paul G3 SEM has sent to us. And firstly, it says, I don't know if the attached pictures can be used because you might need to pixelate my face a bit. I think we need to do that. Many were taken at SV1SV, which was a Greek station at the Scout World Jamboree on the plains of Marathon in August 1963. It was organized by the Greek Radio Club and the US Navy and gave me my first taste of operating pileups. I was 17 at the time and was one of two scouts representing Norfolk at the Jamboree. As I'd taken a copy of my license, I was allowed to operate, but my photo was not allowed in case the Greek licensing people got to see it. As you'll see, the transmitter was home built, no case and 700 volts on the PA anodes there on the right hand side of that, that transmitter. Uh, and a Drake 2B receiver. Transceivers weren't around then, Paul says, and smoking and drinking was freely encouraged whilst operating. <laughs> now the next picture is SV1SP, and in this picture, Paul is the youthful chap in the front row right hand side, bottom right, there we are. The smartly dressed scout leader back row second in is Len Jarrett, who went on to organize the Jamboree on the air around the world. Now the next picture is copyright, as you can see, the Scout Association. This was an official press picture, so I've got the words that go with that. And it says, now officially in service is G3TGS, the shortwave radio station operating at baden Powell House, the Boy Scouts Association's International Centre in Kensington, London. Thousands of Scouts throughout the world are now being linked with their colleagues by the station, which is now working at full strength following the installation of amplifying equipment given by Sunbeam Electric Limited. The station has been inaugurated in the presence of the Chief Scout, Sir Charles McLean, by giving, making sorry, a radio link with Scouts in Chicago, USA, where Sunbeam Electric have their head office. And this photograph shows Chief Scout, Sir Charles McLean, and Boy Scout watch on as 19-year-old Paul Wright, because that was Paul's original name, Paul Wright, now Paul Courtright, of Great Yarmouth, a licensed radio operator who runs his own station at home, establishes radio contact with Chicago to inaugurate the station G3 TGS at the baden Powell House Boy Scouts International Centre in London. Fantastic stuff. 19... When was that? Uh, the date of this? Yeah, it was 1966, 11th of March 1966, that press picture. Mm. Got a couple more. This next picture is GB3SP, and SP stands for Sandringham Park Norfolk Scout Jamboree, uh, 1964. And this, in that fact, was the first amateur radio operation ever from a royal site. Let's Paul again. And finally, this picture, GB3BSI, which stands for Brown Sea Island Jamboree Station, which was in August 1967, used to open the World Jamboree in Idaho. There was a V-beam with 350 feet legs used to hold daily links to Idaho. A Les Mitchell G3 BHK, who's inventor of Scout Jamboree on the air, faces him there. I guess that's the gentleman in the white shirt right in the middle of the picture. So thank you very much for sending us those and sharing that, Paul. It's lovely to think that, you know, Scouts brought you into radio. And I'm sure that now, and I know there's a lot of Scout leaders who are in our club and lots of other clubs, as well who bring a lot of young people in but if you've got any other pictures of maybe scout events or other events especially involving young people getting into radio then we'd love to see them and you can drop them to us in the usual address radio at dcpmicro.com as any, any other stories as well but particularly it'd be nice to see some pictures of of young people don't forget if you are showing pictures of young people you need to have had the permission though of the parents involved but i guess that would have been the case anyway to take the pictures nowadays Next, um, we've got a bit of news from Nigel 2 e NLK, and he's doing a charity event in October, which we're going to tell you about nearer the time. But he wants to borrow a body cam or a GoPro camera for it. So can you let him or us know if you can help him with the body cam or a GoPro to borrow just for that event in October? And now this picture from Pete G0FVG. And he says, hi both. I thought I'd send you a picture of this swallow's nest in our cart shed. There were five eggs in the nest there and five chicks last month fledged. So let's hope they all make it as well. Great picture there. And thanks Lovely, for Wednesday night. <clears throat> That's brilliant, isn't it? It's Thursday it's today, though. Oh, Thursday. Sorry. 
Well, he says thanks for Wednesday nights. So hopefully, Pete, you mean Wednesdays and the occasional Thursday. Although I hope we don't have hopefully, what happened last hopefully night. Hopefully not Thursday again. again. No. Now, uh, finally, uh, uh, on this, just to mention that uh, the trophy fox hunt that we did a few weeks ago, um, that was, uh, sorry, that was the friendly fox hunt. Uh, direction finding hunt and uh, we have the trophy one coming up in August but we wondered whether those of you who saw the other one whether you would like us to televise it live or not or maybe just take take a bit of video or, and uh, make a film on it and we'd love to hear your feedback on this and the reason is that we try not to duplicate anything in NARC Live and although it was of great interest and I had lots of complimentary and uh, you know great feedback from it um, my, many of you watch this and you may not have an interest in seeing another fox hunt but if you'd like to see it or you would rather just do a bit of filming on it and uh, show it um, but if you'd like to see it live or, or, or film on it please let us know in the next couple of days there's our usual email address of course and you can just click the link as well in the newsletter uh, email that's also on our website so we'd just love to hear from you and that will help form what we're doing in August 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 a couple of days away yep finally this is where I think we lost the power last night. I think we might have just got to this. But we won't mention it. No. <laughs> might jinx it. Ken M0 KJW says, Knowing how much you two like the little people pictures, I thought you might like this selection that popped up on Facebook. Uh, Tammy, over to you. Yeah, no, um, I think... Well, I don't think... Oh, I was just thinking about what I said last night. But I don't probably want, shouldn't no, be thinking about that. Never do that. No. that doesn't, and Jim will tell us that. You never try and say what you did before because it doesn't work. Okay. So, but just that, but this, is, this, was, this article so, was yeah, about... So, yeah, this it, is an it? article that, that Ken sent us. Um, it was on Board Panda. Uh, it was a link off Facebook. And it's about a Japanese artist that has created a miniature diorama every day for seven years. And there's lots of pictures attached. But what Ken, I think, didn't realise is that it is actually the miniature calendar. It is an article about the miniature calendar. So that's Japanese then. It is Japanese. topical at the moment with all the Olympics yeah, going on as well. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so that that is the, the the little people that we use every week. So thanks for that, Ken. So I did actually use um, the top picture for this week's little people off um, off that article. So this was the first one. So here's the little people for this week, and um, she's. Uh, Getting the creases out of her crisps. <laughs> oh, I love that. That's the sort of crinkly, crinkly, crinkly thing. Yeah, getting but the crinkle ones to turn them into that, normal Pringles. Is, is that how they make them then? I think it might be how they make them, yeah. Really? Yeah. So you mean they start off life as crinkly? Yep. And then that lady irons them and they end up as Pringles? Yeah, like your t-shirts. Although you really? shouldn't look at my t-shirts. It's probably no. got all crinkles in it. <laughs> okay, now that's a brilliant one, isn't it? Yeah. So thanks for Ken for sharing that article. And as Tammy said, that's, that's based on the... Miniature calendar. Miniature calendars dot miniature dash calendar dot com and there's lots of those. Yep. And we're glad you bring us that feature every week. Thank you, Tammy. So, what have you been doing? Um, we, we've seen some of your pictures and things tonight that we've had both from the weather and other things as well. We do love you to keep in touch. Don't forget to send us an email to this address. It's radio at dcpmicro dot com. And if you can do that by three o'clock on a Wednesday we'll pretty much be certain to get it on that show or one very, very soon afterwards. But we do love to hear from you. It helps to keep the club in touch. Now, that competition. So let's, let's look at firstly this week's shack. And who do you think works in a shack like this? Have we had anybody guess? Um, I don't think we have actually. Um, I don't have a mouse. Can I have a mouse? Oh, I'm sorry. Please? Yep. Thank you. Um, I'll just double check. I don't think we have either, actually. No. I've looked. So we have had a guest, though, from Chris G4CCX. He sent us an email and he said, Hi, David and Tammy. I think this is Stephen M6KYF's shack this week. Have we had anybody No, we haven't had no. any, any okay. other guesses. So that's the only guess. And there was a real plug in there for his shack. And I'll tell you about that in a moment when we reveal whose shack this was. Well, I can reveal that it was... Stephen M6 K -Y So absolutely full marks and everything to Chris G4CCX for getting that. Now I wonder how he got it because the, the idea is this. If you have a look at that little mains plug on the wall, and I know it's not quite so easy probably to see down TV, but we did put it on our website as well on I Facebook. Can, have I got a mouse? No, we probably can't do that very can't easily, can we? No, I don't think you can do it on there. But anyway, no. on that plug, he left the call sign. But uh, you have to I look closely for it. I can't read that from here. No. So. Nor can I. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much. It's all the fun that's taking part. Now, this is important because the next shack I'm going to show you is the very last shack the that last we shack. have. Yeah. Unless you know different. 
So let's show you that shack. And so who do you think worked? There's a worked at the end of this because it's no longer their current shack. Who do you think worked from a shack like this? Now, that's not someone with a very cloudy head. <laughs> that would have given the game away. But um, I wonder who you can t if you can tell whose shack that was. Very well-known member of the club. Lots of racks of equipment there. I'm not going to give you any more clues than that, really. But it was from some time ago. Actually, it was from the 1980s. And I'll give you one other little tiny clue. Is it was fairly near Wyndham. That might help you or might not. So that was that shack. But who is behind that white bubble? Do you know? Because this could be the last shack. We have now reached everybody. I'm pretty sure we covered it. I know a couple of you have sent us alternative shacks and shacks of friends and things like that, you know, when you've gone around there. But we don't, because they're going to be so difficult, almost impossible to guess, we are going to cut feature them, but we're not going to make them as part of the competition because you can see it's already very difficult, I think, and people need a clue and an idea. So only the main shacks. But if you've got a shack and you haven't shared it with us yet, this is the very moment. If you don't do it by next, well, Tuesday, really, mm -hmm. we're going to be, this will be the last shack. And then what we are going to do is a special roundup, um, a fun shack sort of thing for the, for the whole of the animal. We'll show you a couple of shacks that we haven't been able to show you for good reason. There's a lovely, funny one, which I've, I've had for months and months now, which one of us you sent us and would be lovely yeah. as an alternative one. And you can do that as well. But if you haven't sent your main shack, this is the time. Because although I said it at Christmas... Was it Christmas you said I it? I said it, I think at Christmas, that we've <laughs> nearly run out. Amazingly, you've kept them flowing for us yeah, for the I think this era. is about 70, 71 maybe. Is it? And we've like probably that, yeah. had, what, 26, 30 shacks since Christmas. So it's amazing where they came from. So I think we might have eked out every one. But Definitely. if you've got one that you've been done, you think you haven't got quite round to sending us, this is the time to do it. Because when we finish the competition, we are going to stop it there. And we're going to start a brand new one very soon. So... Once again, this email address is where to send your picture of your shack if you haven't already submitted your main shack to us. It's radio at dcpmicro.com. Or if you've got a fun picture of a shack, you want to put that, and we'll put that in the roundup of the shacks in a few weeks' time. Yeah. That's it, radio at dcpmicro.com. And that's indeed for anything else uh, for the, for the programme, that email address. Remember this card? This is our, our club card that we send to at least one a week to people normally we send to anybody who's maybe a celebration birthday anniversary not feeling too good whatever we're very happy to send this card on behalf of you and us and the whole of the radio club of course as well that's the email address to send it to and any other stories and any other news that you've got for us or as pictures well or videos pictures or exactly yep. so before we get on to our tonight's main event just to let you know what's happening on the club next week uh on Sunday, we've got the GB Tourist News at 7 o'clock on GB3NB. On Monday, 2nd of August, we've got the Monday Night Net at half past 7 on GB3NB uh, with Steve G3EVA, and it will again be a general model and a load of old squit. Load of old squit. Is that right? Or that, that sounds like more West Country when Yay, I put it on. Yeah, you sound funny. It's because you're a Suffolk boy. Shh. <laughs> You've never mentioned that before. I've lived here since eight, so that makes me Norfolkish, doesn't it? Norfolkish. Okay, at half past eight on Monday, the 80 meter CW net. And then next Wednesday, the 4th of August, here we have Ian White, GM3 SEK, and he's joining us live to give us an independent look at the new EMF regulations. I say that because most of the things that we've covered on this program and other things have all been based around the RSGB and the RSGB EMC committee and things. And Ian's going to give us a slightly different perspective from the inside as well. So it's going to be very interesting to hear him. He's a very good speaker, as I'm sure many of you have seen and met him before as well. So that's next Wednesday at half past seven on Narc Live. And don't forget, I'm going to mention one more time, that shack. If you haven't sent your shack yet, you need to do it. Well, that's the finish of it. Anyway, thank you very much. For all of that. Now we're going to meet our tonight's guest and he'll, be, he'll need no introduction. We've already seen him in fact once tonight and although I should have booked him for a <laughs> talk on weather forecasting, he's actually <laughs> here to tell us more about propagation, ease and and about uh, PropQuest. Uh, sorry, I was just, there was just, when we just get Jim on, there's just one other question we want to just ask about the rainbows before we start Jim's talk. Okay, we'll do that in a moment. So let's meet you again, Jim. Jim. <laughs> Hello, Good to David see you. <laughs> 
So we've got a question on rainbows, Tammy. There is. Paul, G3VPT, says, Evening all, a question for Jim. Could I have seen three rainbows or did I dream it? Um, I suppose technically it's possible. Um, I, don't, I don't recall anybody getting a picture of one, so I've never seen one either as a photograph or in real life. Um, when something's reflected internally within a, a, a rain droplet, there's nothing to stop it being reflected multiple times, I guess. So um, there's no sort of end stop. What happens is the, the ray loses energy. And um, e each time there's a re reflection, you'll lose a little bit and, and so on and so forth. So mm, it's, a, it's a good one to get evidence of, Paul. That would be uh, finding, well, like finding could, gold at the end of the rainbow. Or, or could it have been related to anything you've been drinking, just as a thought? I mean. Well, there could be that. It's, um, yeah, re requires more water with it, possibly. Yeah. But water is what's causing it anyway. So. so we need photographic evidence, Paul. Yeah, so there you go. There's, that's a good plug-in for set people but sending great, stuff. Great observation, if that's what it was. Yeah. Brilliant. All right. Well, say, so Jim, here, we're really here, though, no, tonight, aren't we, not to talk about the weather, but we're here to talk about propagation. And we're always saying in the club about how propagation is, is so important to us uh, for our hobby. But one of the difficult things is, 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 pro is forecasting, so we know what to work when, um, especially when conditions have been so difficult recently. So go ahead and tell us, firstly, where we are maybe a, in, the in the sporadic E season. Well, we're, we're kind of past the peak, and um, uh, I, I think for those who are into sporadic E, it's um, been a, a, a little bit um, off and on this year's season. So there have been some very good days, some stunning days, and there's been quite a bit of days, quite a number of days, which are, well, a little bit lacklustre. Today is one of them, but you expect that as you get towards the end of the end of the season. So to put it into context, the season usually is taken as being from May through June, July and August. You get a little bit of overlap at either end. Um, and, and there isn't a time of the year, to be honest, I should say, when there aren't any E's. The E's has been have been recorded virtually in, in every month from somewhere or other. Uh, so, so it's not a you can't have ease at other times. It's just that the mechanisms and various other ingredients that go to make it up are, shall we say, less strong or less common. Yeah, thank so, you. Well, so, I mean, so we're kind of just past halfway. Brilliant, Jim. Well, I'm going to let you get back to your presentation in a moment, but just a reminder to everybody at home now, that as well as asking questions right at the end, you can ask questions during the, the talk. Um, Jim's very happy to take questions like that, and we'll keep an eye on them. And if any, they're particularly pertinent to read out during the talk, Jim, we'll read them to you. But otherwise, it's over to you. Thank you. Well, uh, good evening, and um, nice to be back for a second go. Um, David and Tammy stole my thunder yesterday. So. Ah, ah, I see what you did there. <laughs> boom, boom, <laughs> and everybody else's. Um, so, so this time we're going to um, cover what happens um, in the shack. If you want to find out just that little bit more about um, propagation in terms of what conditions are like at the moment. Now, to do that, I know uh, a lot of you are experienced old hands at this, and you you've been operating for a long while, and you have a very good idea of how the ionosphere works and the times of day to listen and things like that. But th there's always going to be a proportion of young amateurs or, or young amateurs in terms of getting a license, not necessarily an age, who uh, are at the beginnings of the hobby. And I just want to recap a little bit of some of the stuff that's taught in the various um, courses leading up to getting a license about how we define the ionosphere and what happens and, and so on, because some of this stuff is fundamental to understanding what websites like PropQuest and many others that provide useful propagation data uh, are about. And you can't really get into those unless you're familiar with some of the um, fundamentals, shall we say. Nothing too heavyweight at all, but it's just going over what, uh, I apologise, might be old ground for some of you. But um, just um, bear with me and we'll get on to the, the, the real stuff. So, so this is all about how to use various tools 
to operate with what the ionosphere is doing rather than sitting there doggedly determined to work VK when there's not a hope in heck of the thing actually being open in that direction or wanting to work sporadic E when conditions are in no way uh, suitable for it. So in, in a way, it's all about saving you wasting your time and um, uh, maximising the returns from the time you spend in the shack. So let's uh, have a little look about um, what we're going to talk about. Um, we're going to have a quick primer on the ionosphere, which is um, uh, what I've just been talking about. We're going to look and very briefly talk about how it's measured and then going to consider what PropQuest set out to do. Um, when we uh, started PropQuest, there were several things that, that arose that I thought would be nice to, you know, we've all sat there in front of a computer screen and say, wouldn't it be nice if you could have a plot of this, that or the other? Well, PropQuest was was an answer to some of those questions about provocation um, from, from, from my shack and uh, thought, uh, yeah, let's, let's have a go. And luckily I worked with some very clever people, uh, one of whom is an excellent programmer who helped enormously putting this together. So we'll have a look at that good work in a moment. And then we'll look individually at sections of PropQuest to see how it works. So we'll look at the basic plots from the ionosonde. In case you don't know, um, I'm sure most of you do, but an ionosonde is the name given to an instrument which measures the electron density in the ionosphere. So it can come back with numbers that can be used to calculate what your critical frequency is, for example, and uh, we'll go on to that in a moment. But that's a really important thing. To be able to plot that data in real time is a, is a wonderful insight into what um, the bands should be sounding like. We're also going to look at um, what happens when you archive that data to see how it operates over longer time periods. So, for example, if you were part of a club and you thought to yourselves, right, let's have a club net. When should we do it? What band should we use? What time of day shall we use? Um, all those questions can hopefully be answered by looking at what climatology tells you about the, the, the values measured by these ionosons. So you, there's no point setting up an 80 metre club sked uh, net uh, if 80 metres is not open. So, so it's, it's fundamental uh, and it's obvious, really, but this is a way of looking at a graph and saying, yeah, that figures, I'll not organise it then. Let's push it to later in the evening and so on. Um, and then something new, which I've been working on for the last year, which is to get all of these, um, well, sporadic E is, is absolutely the, <laughs> the, uh, uh, the soak away for all the wonderful and nefarious ideas about what causes it. It's got so many theories and, and um, how shall we say, weather sayings, the equivalent of weather sayings about what makes it, that there's, um, you know, as many ideas about what causes sporadic E as there are amateurs. And um, th this sporadic E predictor was, was kind of a way of looking at how I, as a meteorologist, can come up with some guide as to which directions are preferable. So it's not about the ionosphere bit, the physics upstairs there. It's about which bit in my domain, the weather bit, is most influential in where sporadic E happens. So, so this indicator is a way of getting a lot of these predictors together to give you one, one map that shows you roughly where the best um, chances are. And then a few words at the end about developments, because like in anything that you get an interest in, usually what happens, and, and in particular, as a result of talks like this, you end up getting more questions and you get questions that are really very, very um, compelling for a new line of research, a new direction to go in for, for putting things together. And I've been um, exchanging emails with um, a GM a um, couple of days back uh, about some ideas which um, could work well on the website. And then I had a long phone call with another GM today about various things to do with paths across uh, the polar regions. So, so there's always folk who, who really do roll their sleeves up and get their hands wet in propagation and actually go on the bands and have QSOs and have huge valuable amounts of um, information to contribute. And that's the nice thing about dealing with propagation. You, you actually 
you, you can kick it off, say, for example, but it's the operating and the logs of all the people who are out there day by day uh, putting new squares in the logbook, working new countries and so on. It's that information that comes in that feeds the interest and quite often pushes research into other directions that you might not have thought of going in. So, so it's a big um, thumbs up to fellow amateurs because without your logs and without the tales that you tell about sporadic E and the quirks of it, then a lot of this stuff wouldn't, wouldn't get uh, looked at. So uh, anyway, uh, new developments spring from that and um, there'll be a little bit, bit at the end about some of those. So let's go back to the beginning and our primer. So basically the ionosphere is, is split into some well-defined layers, which, well, some less well-defined than others, but, but we are all probably familiar with the D layer, the E layer and the F layer. And the, the intensity of these layers of ionization um, depends upon the sunspot cycle. It depends upon the seasons and it depends upon the time of day. Uh, well, well, those two are sort of subsequent to it being to do with the sun's radiation that creates them. So um, uh, we, 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 we then have this sort of array of layers, um, the lowest being the D layer, which tends to be non-productive. In fact, it hinders things. And then we get the E layer, which is where my interests are uh, for sporadic E and aurora and things like that, and meteor scatter. Uh, but also above that, the main workhorse layer is the F layer. And um, well, it's the one that does all the heavy lifting for HF propagation. So it has quite long path distances. The skip distance um, is quite long, about 4,000 kilometers or so. Um, but um, the lower layers, and, and bear in mind, I've put that little indicator on the, um, on the left there, this thing here saying logarithmic scale, because obviously it's not, it's not a fixed scale. So here we have Mount Everest, and then you, short distance above, half as much, you know, about the same height above, you've got all this stuff going on. Well, it's clearly a lot higher than that. So, so one of the interesting things we'll talk about uh, in the talk is, is this link between stuff at this sort of level the top of the weather bit of the atmosphere and these ionized layers, because there's a big gap there and we've got to find ways of communicating across it. So, so that's, um, that's something of interest. Anyway, this is a logarithmic scale. So the highest, I, I think the E layer was discovered first and they called it the E layer because that's where they discovered a load of electrons. And then they kind of got uh, left footed a bit because they, discovered other layers that had perhaps slightly more electrons. So they couldn't call that the E layer because they'd already named one. So they decided to go alphabetically. So there we are. So we've got these layers, which we depend upon as, uh, as radio amateurs. So the D region is the problem one because if that gets too strongly ionized, um, it can absorb radio waves, particularly lower frequencies. So the reason why if you're new to the hobby, you might think, oh, well, this is great. I can talk to all my, all my chums who've just got their licenses in the UK and so on, or whichever country you're watching this from. Local stuff, um, the D layer becomes a real problem for um, short distance communication because it's a very strong absorber when it's ionized. And so during the daytime, the D layer absorbs the LF band. So you don't hear anything from your local nets on 80 or 40 or whatever, um, uh, especially during the summer months. So, so they, they go out of the window as an option. So luckily it's not there all the while. So, so at night, the delay, because the ionization has stopped, the sun's rays are no longer beating down on it, um, it fades away. So we can um, get past that into the layers above. So the D layer is a, is, is a real difficulty for LF bands. Doesn't really affect um, the HF bands in quite the same way, but for 40 meters, 80 meters and top band, um, you're virtually limited to ground wave distance, you know, so that sort of thing. So, so this little diagram shows roughly how that, uh, how that works. So during the daytime on the left-hand side of this diagram here, you can see the sun shining away there and got an ionized D layer and your signal doesn't get through and you're limited to ground wave here. But uh, at night, as the D layer decays, then 
your signal can get all the way to the F layer, which is why it should be no surprise that say you can you can work across the pond to America from the UK at night on 80 meters quite easily and 160 as well, 40 meters. So you just need slightly bigger antennas on 160. But, but the point is the F layer is a really good workhorse for the LF bands during nighttime paths. So you want to be uh, going from, from uh, the night across the nighttime part of the globe for the uh, long distance DX on the LF bands. Anyway, it's a, it's a fundamental of the hobby, but it, it shows you that these layers all have differing effects. So then we have the one in the middle, which wasn't on the previous diagram, just to make it clearer. But in this case, we're talking about sporadic E, written usually as a capital E subscript S. And, and it's um, called sporadic E because it happens sporadically in time and in location. So, so it's got all sorts of quirkiness to it. And traditionally, we've always thought of sporadic E uh, as being, you know, 10 metres, 6 metres, 4 metres, and rarely 2 metres. So, so it's these high HF and low VHF, and, and VHF bands, really. Um, the skip distances are a bit shorter. These figures I took from the examination manual, but in practice, the longer skip distances with sporadic E can be as much as about 2,400 kilometers. So, but it's, it's notably shorter than the F region, which is the F layer, which is higher. So, so um, the other thing we know about sporadic E is that you often get two peaks of E's activity. You get one in the morning and another one late afternoon and early evening. And we'll, we'll perhaps touch a little bit on that, although it's not part of this talk, but there are separate talks online about sporadic E and, and how it forms. And it's quite, it's quite involved. Um, uh, th there was an article, I published an article in Radcom Plus online version for the more technical articles in, in the RSTB archive. And that came out in May and that contains uh, an up-to-date sort of state of where I am in sporadic E work and, and possibly uh, you'll get from that some notes about where we go next. Anyway, point is sporadic E is a real challenge and it's something that's uh, super interesting to tinker around with. Okay, uh, so, so bear in mind that some of the facts and figures on here being taken from um, training courses based on knowledge at the time, I think I prepared these back in 2012, um, some of the things are um, are updated continuously, and that's what happens with uh, research. Research allows you to be more descriptive of what actually happens, as opposed to perhaps a theoretical understanding, or maybe um, a early understanding before we had the coverage that we do now. Um, so, so be prepared for what you took to be an absolute solid fact about something to be updated. Doesn't mean it was wrong before, it was right with the knowledge that was there at the time. Anyway, what else can we tell you about? Well, these terms and, and phrases that we use, sky wave, ground wave, you're all familiar with. There is a portion between two stations where the ground wave doesn't reach and um, you don't get a signal across. And um, the distance between the two, which comes back via the ionosphere is the skip distance. So, Typically 4,000 kilometers for the F region, for the F layer. Um, okay, so what happens is, I mean, these aren't drawn uh, to any sense of scale. So, so it's not like a very peaked uh, tent, like a bell tent. It's a very shallow sort of angle. So low angle radiation from beams that emit very close to the horizon are, are the way to get maximum distance. And if you do that, you will get your, yourself entering the ionosphere at a shallow angle. And therefore, you're, the effect is that you will be better able to get a refraction and uh, come back at some great distance away, one skip distance, in fact. But if you go too steeply up to it for the amount of ionization that's there, your signal will go right through it, which is what happens with this example here. So here, your signal goes right the way through the F layer because it's not ionized enough to return 30 megahertz. It's not quite ionized enough, enough to return 25 megahertz, but it is to return 20 megahertz. So you can see 
this maximum usable frequency in this case is somewhere between 20 megahertz and 25 megahertz. And typically it's always been thought that um, about three to four times the critical frequency is the number that you tend to work on. But it could be quite a bit more than that for sporadic E. It could be five uh, to even 10 times if you're talking about data modes. So um, th th it's a guide. So these numbers, these critical frequencies are a guide. And um, quite often it's interesting more to see how they vary from time to time or from day to day than it is to have an absolute value. Anyway, we'll come to that in a moment. So you, you, we've introduced the concept, concept of the maximum usable frequency, but then you have a lowest usable frequency and that is determined by the D layer. Remember I said it absorbs low frequencies. So that allows you a window of opportunity of certain frequencies that will get through and be refracted by the F layer. And during the day, the F layer gets even more complicated because it splits into two. Um, but nonetheless, it is, um, it is the workhorse for all HF sort of operation around the globe. So um, that's, uh, that's really important to us to know what the F layer is doing and to know what the critical frequency is. So when you, when you get HF communications, um, people often talk about fading and QSB and such like. And um, there, 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 are, there are, as you can imagine, multiple ways a signal can go from point A to point B. It, it, uh, you hear it, for example, on two meters when you listen to a signal from a distant repeater and an aircraft flies between the two. You'll get a fluttering effect as the path distances um, interfere with each other from, from, um, from the distant station. And the same thing happens when you might get um, refractions from both the F1 or the F2 layer, for example, and you might get fading. Uh, you could get interaction with the E layer as well. So there's all sorts of things, which means that signals are very rarely constant. You know, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be expected to be a straight line on your S meter. You know, you've got variations that are changing all of the time due to these different path lengths. So QSB isn't something that's wrong with your aerial. It isn't something that's wrong with your receiver. It is just what it does. It, uh, it happens that in the real world, there are multiple paths for signals that go from A to B. And usually we end up latching on to the strongest and it's all fine, but occasionally things interrupt it and we, we get um, interference from signals that have come via a different route. So let's uh, now do the last little bit of this primer, which is about how it's measured. And um, to measure the critical frequency, um, the ionosond installation um, sends a transmits the signal vertically upwards and determines if it can get a reflection um, back from within the ionosphere. So the signal will go up and it will come back down again. And if it's too high a frequency, it will go right through it if there isn't enough ionization there to turn the ray to bring it back down again. So this critical frequency at which it ceases to come back is a very useful property for predicting propagation. And it's called the critical frequency, the frequency at which if you turn the VFO and go high enough in frequency, eventually your signal goes right the way through the layer and doesn't come back again. So the typical critical frequencies in the summer are different to in the winter. Now you might think that the summer it's going to be uh, greater, but in fact it isn't. In the summer it's four megs to nine megs, and uh, in the winter it's three megs to 14 megs. Um, not, not the place to go into why, but there, there's a lot of chemistry goes on up there, and um, things change in different seasons, and, and, and all, all this stuff is understood by the ionospheric physicists to the extent that we amateurs can take this as a given, but it, but it does mean um, these are the values that you expect to see recorded as critical frequency. And what will often you, you'll find is that it's measured on an ionosond print on a plot of the data. It's called the FOF2, which is the reflection, the critical frequency of the ordinary ray from the F2 layer. And you get, um, an extraordinary ray as well, which gives you a different value. 
So, so it all gets complicated. But the point is, these things are important in that they determine what the band is like, where the ionosonde is. And, and that's, that actually is another important thing in itself. Uh, ionosons measure the ionosphere above you. They don't know anything about what it's like over there, um, out across the Atlantic. They only know what it's like where it is. So you have to learn how to get a sense of how your local ionosond might change during 24 hours, and then imagine that pattern shifting across with the sun and the ionization. So, so, so you, you can't necessarily extrapolate uh, for a long path by what you're seeing on an ionosond in the UK. But uh, it's all a good guide. So, and, and also it shows you how these things vary. So ionosonds, it's, a, it's an instrumentation that transmits a radio signal vertically upwards, but it sweeps the frequency. It's like your worst nightmare of designing a VFO. You switch it on and go up the band and away. And uh, eventually when it gets to the point where it goes right the way through, that is measuring the critical frequency of the F2 layer when it goes right through. So uh, that's what it looks like when it's plotted. And there are varying websites about where you can look at these things. And you'll see in the left-hand margin here, some of the parameters that come out. This, this one here, FOF2, is where these curves curve upwards and it goes zoom. So it's going through. And sometimes you get these slightly fainter ones above it, spaced. And this is what happens when the signal comes up from the ground, gets ref refracted back down by this one, goes back up again and gets refracted back down by this one. Same one, but because it's had twice the journey time, it appears to be twice as high. And if it's really strong and you get a good uh, reflection off the ground, it can do it a third time. So when you see these things, there aren't three different versions of the critical frequency. It's just multiple multiple journeys up and down to the F2 layer, which is which is here in this instance. So where this red line curves up, that's that's the line where you get the critical frequency and that's the FOF2, which in this instance is 7.808 megahertz. Now we did, we did, what date is this here? Let's have, does it tell us the date? Uh, November the 3rd. So let's just go back and see in the winter, um, 7.808 megahertz is right in the middle of that, that sort of range. So you can see that all fits. And then we have the similar value for the ease, which is down here, and that's 2.53 megahertz. And that's where this one starts to go. So that's 2.53 megahertz. And then something else I look at is the, the virtual height of the ease layer. And, and that's a measurement of altitude. This is the scale going up here of altitude. So the left-hand y-axis is, is 80 kilometers, 200, 300, 400, and so on, all the way up to 900 kilometers on this particular plot. But the point is, um, you can read off on the x-axis what this value of megahertz is for the thing. And then you get along here, these MUF figures for, for different um, path distances. So if you go straight up and down, you need a lot of ionization to get your signal to come back. But if you come at it from a shallow angle, you need less ionization. So although the straight up and down value in this case might be seven megs or 7.8 we saw there, the FOF2, if you go in at a shallow angle, you might find that a signal even as high as, well, let's have a look down here, this 3000 kilometer path, it says 27 megahertz. So you can see that um, you can get um, quite a high frequency brought back down again if you go for the longest skip distances. Uh, so that, that'll become quite important later on when we look at um, PropQuest. So that's how it's measured. So uh, I, I, actually what I could do, David, is just see if there are any questions coming in at the moment before That's we start brilliant, looking at the Brilliantly anticipated, Jim, actually, because, um, yes, there has been a question that's come in during that, which isn't specifically about PropQuest, so I thought before we moved on to that, maybe I could ask you this. Um, and this is from James, M1TES, and he says, I often wonder why, when we have sporadic E openings on 28 megs, we also get NVIS 
NVIS on 20 and 40 meters. NVIS is near vertical incident skywave. Um, so that's yeah, what he well, asks. Yeah, well, that's a good question, James. And, and the fundamental thing is we we get locked into the idea that sporadic E is, um, uh, you know, 10 meters and above. But actually, this this whole thing about PropQuest was picked up because we wanted to explain why our Monday night NARC nets, the Norfolk Amateur Radio Club nets, on 80 meters were so different from one day, one week to another. We had them regularly every Monday night on CW. And um, some weeks you'd have a good net, some weeks the signals would be poor, some weeks they'd be very strong until they suddenly fall off a cliff. And we just wanted to look to see what the difference was between those different occasions. But also the club takes part in the RSGB's 80 meter club um, club contests. And, and those, are, those are really interesting and uh, keenly fought contests, which the Norfolk Club, I have to say, we, we enjoy doing and do very well in. But um, it's important to know why, why a particular contest behaved very well and another one didn't. So we started looking at these results for 80 metres. And it turns out, of course, that, that if you've got a critical frequency from the ease layer, which is above the band you're on, say 80 metres or whatever, then you'll get these NVIS contacts. So sporadic E is is what's driving a lot of that and um uh that's that's really where you can um where you can benefit i mean there will be incredibly strong f layer ionization sometimes but um it's it's uh, almost certainly you're talking about some very local strong signals which come out come out of sporadic e affecting these lf bands okay thanks jim and uh just a reminder to anybody now who's been watching this, if you'd like to ask questions, you can ask them during or straight afterwards at the end. But if you've got any questions as, as Jim goes along and you put them in either on Facebook or on BATC, we'll be happy to read them to Jim. But back to you, Jim. OK, so the aims of ProcQuest, um, it was to, I felt, it, it, we're so used as radio amateurs to listening to the bands. And OK, latterly, uh, those of us with SDR, um, rigs, we see the bands. And that's also something that really illuminates what conditions are doing and how you, you might tune up and down the band on a traditional rig and you'll, you'll hear a signal and you might tune back down again later on and there's another signal, but you won't get that complete picture. And what happens with an SDR is that you'll suddenly find that all of the signals all the way along the bit of the band you're in all come up at once and and uh, they're not all transmitting at once, but you know you'll get this random thing. But but the, they all appear to come up to a better state, and then they fade away again, and so on. So there are things going on in the ionosphere that affect signals on quite a wide geographic area, but there are also things that happen in a very focused way. So the idea was that uh, it'd be wouldn't it be nice to um, have a look at some of these ionosons and look at the graphs while we're having a QSO, not do a study two or three days later or a month later if somebody says, can you look into this? L let's have a look at it now in real time. And, and PropQuest has, has really fulfilled that role because during the contests and during the SCEDs, we're all regularly checking the FOF2s to see how it's going and you can judge from that when to change your strategy, for example, from working G stations to looking at the more distant stations if the band goes long skip and so on. So the graphs do really explain why the bands sound as they do. And, and what's a good thing to do is to get used to equating those, those band sounds that you hear from your receiver with what the graph looks like, because the graph is telling you about the physics that's making the band happen and do what it does. So, so we wanted also to use the archive data to plan suitable SCED times. We wanted to use it, I wanted to use it to predict the likelihood of ease locations. And I wanted to use it to predict or to test the paths that have happened. So not just trying to predict where it's gonna happen, but, but say, look at an event where there's been a big opening in a certain direction and say, can we get something from these bits of data 
uh, about sporadic E to say why it's happening where it is and so on. Uh, and, uh, and also uh, partly to encourage activity on the bands because, uh, uh, you know, a lot of our knowledge about things like this uh, comes from you, uh, you know, putting your logs in on the cluster sites and, and so on. And that's what makes it all fizz along because we're suddenly getting all this array of data about how it's put together. And um, in, in order for one of these theories to work or a predictable theory to work, um, with prediction theory to work, you need to be able to test it all the while. And um, to test it, you need activity. So uh, yeah, it's all it's all good. So I just want to say a couple of words about uh, the people involved. I, I'd like to just do a big thank you to WeatherQuest, the company which um, I used to uh, be with before I retired. And um, I'm using a lot of weather data from their servers. And, and it's been absolutely fantastic of them to let me uh, tinker about with that and, and use that. Weather data is, is vast amounts of information uh, and, and it takes a lot of sifting through. So uh, in order to do that, um, uh, my friend from work, Dan Holly, has been absolutely fantastic. Some of you in our region will know him because he occasionally appears on the weather forecast on the local TV channel, but he's an excellent uh, software programmer and has done a lot of the work on the PropQuest de de database and the server and the website that you see. Took pity on me when I drew one a set of graphs manually. <laughs> and he said, look, you know, you know. anyway, it, it's just excellent. So, so uh, a lot of what we see and we take advantage of on the bands by using it is down to Don, Dan Holly's uh, hard work. He's uh, donated a lot of his time uh, freely to this project. So um, uh, big up to Dan for that. Excellent. And, and then another resource I want to mention specifically is the Lowell Ionosond database, which is a big international database where all the Ionosond data goes to and is stored. It's over in the States in, um, in Massachusetts. And uh, that's the repository, which I go and um, access when I want to look at the uh, eye on the sun data and which Dan's program accesses. So, so it's vital to research in, in propagation and uh, for amateurs to be able to make use of these uh, professional uh, uh, data servers and, and the research that drives them is, is just fantastic. So a great collaboration there. And I'm, I'm on behalf of amateurs, really grateful that we have such good sort of connections to be able to do that. It's, it's fantastic. So uh, big thank you to uh, the professional research arm of the ionosphere as well. Uh, and, and, and perhaps most important of all in the amateur radio context is, is you folk who, who submit logs and, and band reports to the clusters. I mean, it's just fantastic what, um, what's enabled by you doing that. Um, the, the, the fact is you can look at forecasts of where you think the indicators suggests that an ease patch might be, uh, but unless somebody bothers to put in a log, when, for example, I got into the habit of whenever I work something on ease, not in a contest because it's not time, but in ordinary um, state of affairs, if I'm working um, somebody on ease, as soon as I finish the QSO, I'll submit it to one of the cl clusters, you know, the DX clusters. And uh, that means it gets plotted as a red line on a map and others can see which directions are open and it encourages activity. But also it builds this database of, of which parts of the European domain have produced an ease patch. And that's really important to, to steer these sorts of projects forward. And then of course, there's all the projects that you can't, you can't name because there isn't time. And there's loads of folk, we, you know, the BGS, British Geological Survey for their data for the geomagnetic field dip angle and all sorts of folk out there who, who, who've done wonderfully well in being free with their advice and information and uh, including the RSGB's Propagation Studies Committee, uh, several very good friends there who've been very supportive. So, so this is all great stuff and, and it's a collaborative team thing. So just because I'm sitting here talking to you about it doesn't mean I'm the only one doing it. There's a lot of people behind there. So uh, let me just press this button here. Now this is where um, I could show backup screen grabs, but I'm going to try and do um, this with, um, uh, I'm gonna try and do this now by going live onto um, 
prop quests. So this is where all the best laid plans. Okay, while you uh, find those on your screen, Jim, um, we'll uh, we'll watch and uh, just I've got a, a, actually a, a nice couple of two part question from okay. uh, Rick M7 GMT, but um, I can leave that if you like. I'm, no, no. Uh, well, I've got some charts here, but it doesn't matter. Let's let's answer Rick's well, question. Well, I've, it's easier sometimes <clears throat> to do them when they're fresh. Isn't fine, it? that's fine. Yeah. Well, the Tim uh, Tammy tells me that we can uh, us men can only do one thing at a time. But there we are. They're going to prove that. Ba difference. Barely that. Barely well, that. <laughs> Shut up. Anyway. Sorry, did I say that out loud? Yeah, yeah, it did, unfortunately. But anyway, let's quickly move on. This is from Rick M7 GMT. He says, Hi, Jim. Is the mass of data now being collected by the thousands of stations running FT8 helping with research about ease? PSK reporter claims 21 billion spots in their database. Yeah, it, it's uh, that's a super question. I mean, um, my journey through ease began in the late 80s when there were only... Uh, post um, document, post event documented uh, paths mentioned in the columns in the various magazines, shortwave mag, ragcom, practical wireless, and so on. So, so one didn't have this great resource that we have now. The data modes have provided an overwhelming amount of data. Now, uh, at some stage, there will be a good time to to go into those and do some proper. Uh, research, especially the automated systems that are running all the time. Um, so you can imagine a lot of amateur radio data about ease kind of depends upon when people are there to operate and, and identify the path as happening. So the fact that there isn't a path documented doesn't mean that there wasn't one. It just means that somebody wasn't on the band at that time to illuminate it and say, well, there's a path between these two places. Um, so some of these automated systems, the skimmers and such like, and the PSKs and things, and the beacons and so on, some of those data sets are a great resource. So, so it's, it's, it's actually incredibly valuable that this data is being kept. I, at the moment, my stage of my research is such that um, uh, I would be overwhelmed by that at the moment. What I'm trying to do is to test the algorithms on the most extreme events, the ones that trigger uh, a path, say, on CW or SSB, because they are harder to come by, require um, greater ionization, and therefore, in my view, greater um, uh, trigger events, if you like, or greater uh, promoting influences that we need to know about. So once we've got those parameters kind of tagged and identified, we can then start applying it to the big field. And, and at the moment, I have to say, I, on the various clusters, I quite often, if I want to see where the real focus of an event is, I will switch off the digital modes and just look at the traditional modes. But the digital modes, when you switch them on again, uh, my, they, they just are so overwhelmingly numerous that you see the bands are technically open in some fashion a huge number of times when hitherto we'd have thought they weren't so it's a it's a real diff difficult thing to um, uh, incorporate into an analysis unless you've managed to sort out what um, what the main triggers are so this is all about formulating which things we need to look at the next steps will be to look at everything and do the correlations to see which ones are more important and so on. But that's a really great question. And, and I have to say, uh, although I'm not active on FD8, I do think it's great for illuminating those marginal events. So before an event starts on CW or sideband, it will be, it will be picked up by those folk on FD8 first. And, and that will allow me to get some idea as to which area I need to look at. And it may even be that it never gets strong enough to appear as a CW path or sideband path. So so we wouldn't have known about it without those digital modes. So, so it's just a case of I'm being restrictive just to limit the amount of data I have to process at the moment, but it won't be the case always. So those paths are really valuable. 
Okay, <clears throat> thank you very much, Jim. And for Rick, uh, Rick did actually ask a, a supplementary question, but uh, uh, as it concerns PropQuest itself, and we haven't really seen PropQuest much yet, if it's all right, Jim, I'm going to leave that to a little bit later when everybody at yeah. home has managed to see it. So now I think we can share your PropQuest screen. So yeah, I'm just there we go. Have a quick... Oh, yeah. yes. And um, for anybody interested, we have put it on several places, including the double head shot there. But if you do want to see this for yourself and you haven't come across it, the address is www.propquest.co.uk. It was all one word, P-R-O-P-Q-U-E-S-T. Anyway, back to you, Jim. Yeah, well, this is the uh, one of the main panels. This, was, this in fact, is the, the beginning of PropQuest. So this is where it started. And it was um, what happens when you... Um, uh, plot a, a graph of uh, the purple ones. You see down the bottom the key. We've got the FOEs, which is the critical frequency for sporadic E. We've got the FOF2, which is the next layer up. And then we've got the maximum usable frequencies from the F2 layer for different path distances. So do you remember I said that um, the, the, the more shallow the angle you go in, the higher the frequency you can use? So the, the other thing which you may not have seen is if you do that, you can switch off all of these lines that you don't want to see. So supposing we went to just the 3000 kilometer path, the longest distance path, you'll see here you've got during the day, um, the maximum usable frequency is way up here above 18 megs. Well, it goes up to 24 megs up here, I think, or 21 megs rather. And um, uh, just just briefly touches it there, um, uh, 20.81 megahertz. But you can see there's quite a bit of variability. So the, the first thing to point out is you've got your sunrise and your sunset time. Up in the top right here, you've got the three stations which we set up uh, to select. Now it defaults to Chilton, um, which is the UK um, uh, uh, research institution that um, the Rutherford Appleton Laboratory, where they uh, where they uh, run the eye on the sun. So it's near Oxford. And just uh, across the way to the west a little way is RF Fairford, which is an American owned site and that um, operates over there. And if you if you click on that one and switch that one off and refresh, you'll get the full data display from Fairford instead of Chilton. Uh, so the reason we've got these multiple ones, they're close together, but two things will come from this. One is you'll see that, that actually there can be quite a big difference from um, one place to another. It might only be 50 kilometers or so apart. So, so ionospheric conditions vary a lot. What's going on up there is very complex. Lots of stuff um, jiffling about that, that gives a non-uniform intensity of ionization and and that's why you get and i'm sure if we plotted it more than at 10 minute intervals or whatever the intervals are in this case uh you would have um you would have some amazingly uh, uh rapid variations uh so these are 15 minute ones i think on fairford but they sometimes vary different sites have different intervals anyway point is that as you go up through um the different MUF distance, skip distances. So the 3000 kilometer one will be the highest. So the next one down is the thousand kilometers and you can choose whichever ones you want, but these are lifted from the data that comes back from the ionosand. So um, what, one thing that comes out and, and as you move your tooltip along, you'll see it highlights the measurements at those times. So it's quite, um, quite cute in that respect. You can see exactly what the figure was. So here you can see the FOEs got up to 7.75 megahertz. Uh, this was this afternoon at about 15.30. Um, Says so the time on the top um, top left of that little tooltip box there. So so um, in this case, the, um, the FOEs was higher than the FOF2. Now it doesn't matter because they're both well above a local net on, um, on 80 meters, but just supposing you were on 40 meters so the seven megs line, this, this one here on the right, if you move that across, you'll see that at 1530, the MUF was greater than seven megs. So during the daytime in the middle of the afternoon today, 
you might have heard some quite strong signals on 40 from envious propagation, even though uh, ordinarily um, you, wouldn't, um, you wouldn't expect it because of D layer absorption and so on. And sometimes um, you, you, can, you can find that um, uh, things when the D layer slowly fades, at the end of the day, we're probably in too much of a peak D layer absorption time here to know that was going on. But in the winter, if you saw one like that, when there wasn't very strong D layer absorption, you might find that you've got a very strong signal suddenly on, on 40 meters. Uh, so here we can see things changing as we go through the evening. But um, the, the, the doldrums, if you like, is this period around and just before dawn, when often there isn't much ionization around that can be picked up. One, one thing incidentally to say about these ionosons is that um, the data comes back from the transmission going up and it's uh, the data is analyzed uh, in a program and it, um, it will eventually come up with a set of answers for these values that we plot here. Now, sometimes it can't make, it can't draw a conclusion and it could be because of the ease getting in the way and it stops it penetrating higher, uh, all sorts of different reasons, but you sometimes won't get a contiguous um, path. Okay, so this is Jim, the just before you go, sorry, yeah. I've got a question though from Peter, G4PNF, who says, what yep. is the significance of the different colours on an ionosond graph? Uh, different colours. Um, the, 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 well, the red curve that goes up um, is the ordinary ray, is the FOF2, and I think the green one is the extraordinary one, which is a different form of um, uh, refraction. So um, I, it's not a domain that I'm particularly knowledgeable about, but I know Steve KYA has done an interesting talk on ionosons and the interpretation of them. And then I think they have little colored blocks off to the side. Um, uh, when we go back to the slides, we could go yeah. back to look at that one. Okay, and also um, Steve I can see is on um, BATC actually on, uh, Peter was on Facebook, but. Uh, Steve's on BATC, so if you know Steve and you can help answer that question, then um, you can always enter that on, on BATC for yeah. us. But, yeah, that'd be, that'd be good, because I don't want to cut across something that's already been said, and I hadn't, um, I hadn't really thought much about the detail of the ion sonde as such. I wanted to concentrate sure. on this. But, okay. but, but there are uh, little coloured boxes in the top right of an, an ion sonde print, which relate to kind of the, the off the off beam reflection so so it goes up and you'll get scattering and reflection coming back from different angles i think something okay. to do with that all but right there's m many out there who are better knowledge better right. knowledge of it well um, thank, thank you for the question peter and we'll try and answer that before the end of the show but back, back to you jim yep, on we, we certainly will. okay so so anyway so this is how this works and um if you find that you've got missing data from one then click on the little tick box for the other one and disable the first one and press refresh and you can um, have a look and see if that's available. And there's also one in northern Bel in Belgium called Dubs, which is um, uh, the Belgian uh, Institute, which researches into uh, the ionosphere and such like at a very good site, very reliable. And it's halfway across to um, nice sporadic E distances. So that's a good one to have in the background. And there was a ca an occasion way back in the beginning when um, both Fairford and the Chilton Arnesons were missing. So we had blank screens and uh, Dubs was added because of that. So that's in Belgium. And then very recently we had a spell where the actual server in the States was affected and uh, that was taken down and offline for about a week and a half, two weeks. So um, nothing was available from that. Um, so that's that put a stop to things for a while, but we're all back online again now, of course. OK, so um, that's the FOF2 tab. I, I should have said at the beginning, it goes without saying any website, because these are quite complex things, you, you want to be able to look at the uh, info about pages. And there's a section on every bit of this um, that explains what you're seeing. Um, th th these aren't necessarily all the technical ins and outs of it. There'll be better places to go and look at look at those uh, facts. But but the the bottom line is, this tells you everything that was put together, why it was there, what it means, and so on. So so that's the the about and the FOF two. 
the the interesting thing about this is that that when you when you have sorry when you have this graph uh, and you're listening on the band it's just it's just so magical to be able to hear what happens as the as the band changes as say sunset comes or whatever uh, and and you know you know what to expect during a contest when you see the lines sliding down and uh, propagation going things like that so so let's go on to this thing which i do uh, oh no i've got things down here to do first um okay so this is the here and now the most recent thing so it's as up to date as we get from the server in the states and the idea of this is that we don't want and they don't want in their system thousands of amateurs from all over the world piling in and accessing data that that's all the same you know i mean this is this is what we've set up with them that, that it's okay for us to go in every 10 minutes to get the updated set of readings for those three stations and that puts them on there and it's there it's available and hundreds of amateurs don't have to go on and do the job separately so it cuts down the bandwidth on their system it, it saves us a lot of faff because it means we do it once and if it's not there it's because something has failed somewhere it could be our server that's failed could be their server it could be the ionison hasn't been able to return a value like you see in here at various stages the the automatic uh, programs that decode it couldn't couldn't evaluate what the figures were so so there's all sorts of reasons but when you think this is quite high state of the art stuff here we are as amateurs in our shacks listening on 80 meters or whatever and you know what's happening up there in the ionosphere you you can you can come up with values you can say to somebody sitting next to you you can say look there's so many electrons per cubic centimeter i mean that to me is just the most mind-blowing thing to be able to do that you can do these things nowadays and and we take it for granted a bit but it's just incredible up there is an ionosphere and and this allows you to see how many electrons per cubic meter there might be and so on and i think it's just staggering so anyway um uh, that that's the today bit now you might say to yourself, well, we had this net the other day, and what was it like? I can't understand why conditions weren't very good then. So if you go on this, you can you can select any date and have a look at it. Um, so if we go back to the first weekend of, um, of, of, of June, which is the HF field day, you could say go back to um, that. You click the date, and then you set go, and that's what the Saturday of field day was like. So you can see all these parameters and see um, and see what was going on. And there was a bit of sporadic key in the evening, I noticed, which was uh, there. So so it's possible to analyze after the event. If you've got a local net and you're wondering why you didn't get through to it or whatever, then then this is the thing to have a look at. And uh, the other thing I should should have said on the first FOF2 graphs, but this this will work just as well. You know how sometimes when you're listening on the band and you're having your local chat and then all of a sudden um, you're not really hearing your your friend up the road 50 kilometers, 100 kilometers away. Uh, you're hearing people from Central Europe, you're hearing DLs coming through or you're hearing an HB9 or, or an SP or something from Poland uh, and you'll hear signals from, so the band has gone long skip and that's because the D layer has stopped absorbing things, so you're opening things out. But providing here your little um, your curve for the FOF2 is um, is above the band you're on, you'll have good local contacts. But but if it goes below the band you're on, then the next one's left to be above it. I'll tell you what we we, we need to do. We need to go to uh, winter when this is um, much more complex. So let's go to. Uh, a typical Monday night net in February. And you'll see here that the band 3.5 megs is here, just where that line is now, just there, this, this second dotted line up from the bottom. So top band is the lowest one, then we've got 3.5 megs. And you'll see here in the evening, at, um, remember in February, so GMT is the real time, when the contest starts, at 20 hundred, we're just bobbling about here at um, 3.5 megs. So local QSOs for club net may be in, may not be in. And providing it stays above that, 
then you're okay for a local net. But if you're below this line, then you're going to hear these lines, which are above it. And those lines are for MUFs, which are a thousand kilometers away. And sometimes it's really neat. You can, you can be listening to a, to a net uh, and, and it's easier to do on sideband um, when you can hear the call signs. And, and if you're not a CW person, that's, that's, that's where you'll be hearing it. So, so you hear this and then all of a sudden you, you can hear the band going long. So, so you might be talking on a net which has got people in the Midlands and then all of a sudden you find you can't really hear them because the FOF2 has gone below the band you're on and you're only hearing people in Scotland and then you can't hear them and you're only hearing people in Poland. And that's because you've gone down below the line. And in order to um, uh, fit this up in a way that's more obvious, um, you know we could remove various um, lines here. I did do a separate um, thing called Envis, which uses the um, FOF2, which is our uh, um, red line as usual. So here you can see the red dots. And then you have the, um, uh, the blue line, which is the spread F index, the FXI. And that is, um, and that is usually about 0.7 of a megahertz higher. So you'll get sometimes when, when it's gone below the band you're interested in, you'll still get uh, some propagation. And then you've got these FOEs for the spread again. And you'll see here, you've got times when the FOEs is above the traditional, um, not ELO, but the FOEs, the e, sporadic E, has got a higher usable frequency than the F layer has. So you'd expect local signals to suddenly come booming in there if it was... Uh, in, in a weekly ionized time of day. Now here we're not, because this is summertime and daytime. But if we go back to our um, January one over here, say, let's go back to January and pick just any old any old day there. And uh, there we go. Uh, so what have we got? 13th of January. Now here we've got sunset at 16.30 in the afternoon, where it changes shading here. And you'll see soon after that, the FOF2 goes below 3.5 megs. So you wouldn't heard, have heard any local stations except for ground wave. So you'll always hear the ground wave bit, but you wouldn't hear people farther afield on 80 meters because your FOF2 is below 80. But just a little bit of the spread, um, the spread F index is above, but occasionally you'll get a spread a key one there. You'll get E's that are slightly above still. So you get these quirky things where the band appears to suddenly burst into life. Everybody has a good signal for half an hour on the net and then it all crashes out again. And all you hear is the long range um, distance stuff from within Europe. And this, this graph is great for showing you what's going on. It, it shows you why it's doing that. So, so get used to looking at these graphs whilst you're listening on the band and trying to put together why the band sounds as it does. It, once you've started doing it and, and interpreted it correctly, it's just amazing the effect it gives because you can apply this to this data if you're in another part of the world. I know we've got uh, viewers and listeners from all over the shop and perhaps one day uh, we'll, we'll make PropQuest a more widespread thing where we do cover other regions. But at the moment, it's a data server management issue while we develop it, but, but who knows? So anyway, uh, this is a great technique for learning how to appreciate what the ionosphere is doing. So that's what the Envis tag is. Um, we also have a, a compare function. So you can compare two dates. So it comes up as a default with today and yesterday. So in the top left, you can select the dates. Well, here we've got today in red. So there's, there's today's value. And you can see that we're running below yesterday's the ionization and um, yesterday in blue was um, a little bit higher in this period, but it looks like it's coming together again here. But supposing you did have a regular net on a, on a Monday evening. So, so let's do, now I, t I told you our club has, has Monday night nets. So let's make the first one, the one on the 5th of July, and we'll make the second one, the Monday night net on the 19th. And let's just, have a little look and see. Uh, ah, that was. <laughs> oh dear. Um, well, I know why that was. Remember, I said at the beginning we had uh, a time when the 
server in the States was not functioning. So, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to make um, this one today. Uh, no, I won't. I'll make it. I'll make it yesterday. So we've got a complete day, and I'll make this one um, middle of winter. So let's go to January, and go to a Monday night net in January. I know this isn't Monday night. But you get the idea. Right now, that, that, there's there's interesting, isn't it? So here we've got. Um, in red yesterday so this is the summertime ionosphere yesterday uh, chung 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 very strong in the evening yesterday in the summer because we have later sunset this line here in the winter in blue which was uh, the 4th of january you can see the fof2 has um, crashed down below 3.5 megahertz down here and sunset is over here somewhere, you know, 1630, um, uh, 15, no, 1630. So, so you can see quite a difference in behavior between summer and winter. Now, a lot of you know that, you know how that works, but also um, a lot of you might be wanting to do more recent short-term comparisons, like what the difference between, well, I'll tell you what we could do. Let's do that while we're on it. Let's do um, the Saturday and the Sunday of CWNFD. So uh, let's do go back a month on this one. June, wouldn't it? Yeah. Yeah, first weekend in June, fifth and sixth. There we go. And um, it appears that the Sunday was, but bearing in mind the contest finished in the middle of the afternoon. So we're looking at the bit when when we were active, which is this first bit through the uh, overnight hours and so on. Not a lot in it from one day to the other. Not a, not a lot in it, but but you can do that over periods mm. that you choose. You know, you could choose this year to last year. You could, you could, I can't remember when we started putting these graphs together. So we've stored the data for them. Um, but it's quite, it's quite fascinating being able to do that little exercise to have a look and see uh, why the, why your local net one week was really successful and another week it was absolutely pants. Um, okay, so that's the compare function. And then the last function on this tab is something called averages. How are we doing for time, by the way? Darling? Oh, we're fine. As much time as you want. Okay. Um, yep. We've got an answer back from Steve as well. So at the right time, if you need okay, a break well, when or something, I finish we'll, this, we'll read yeah? that. Yeah. Okay, well, when I finish this averages bit, um, we'll, we'll bring Steve's answer in. So the averages is what happens when we store all of the data and we can recreate just two key parameters. Obviously, you could do calculations on all sorts of things, but let's do, let's do um, a calculation, uh, say, the difference between the early season for sporadic E. We'll do that first. So let's see what these conditions look like in April. Right. So what have we got here? We've got the red line, which is the average FOF2, which is the red line going along through here, which is the FOF2 for the month of April this year. And it shows the ionization picking up uh, during the daytime and leveling off at about five megs and then dipping away again in the evening. And then the purple line is the maximum FOEs. So in other words, it's not averaging out because because ease is a very isolated, random thing. If you do an average of that, it just flattens it all out and you don't see anything. But if you look at the highest value of ease that was recorded at different hours through the day. So we're still looking at our 24 hour day here from midnight to midnight. And you can see that there is um, OK barely any excitement going on. There's a slight increase which you would get during the daytime because of better ionization. Uh, a couple of notable blips when you can get some quite strong ease. Um, so this was in April. Um, the time was um, 11 o'clock in the uh, middle. It was at an 11 o'clock reading. Yep. And then this other peak was at 1545. So that could have been part of our uh, twice a day sort of sort of thing. And then we've got another trend showing up here with some slightly higher stuff. So it's a way of picking out times of the day when ease is more likely. 
So, so let's now compare that to June. And you just have to remember this. Now, June, this looks slightly different, doesn't it? Because we've got much more color in the in the red line, which is the FOF2. So we, we pick up in these summer months this little um, dusk sort of peak. And there'll be others who are better able to say what that's all about. And the FOF2, the FOEs, the sporadic E, the highest sporadic E at the different hours, shows quite a distinct nose of higher values here, which is the um, early morning till mid morning. And then another one late afternoon, early evening, which are our two traditional um, double peaks for sporadic E showing up. So it shows up in the averages for when it happens. But you can see from all the noise here of these other things that it, it's not just that. There are other things going on and you can get ease at any time. And sometimes it could be a morning thing that lasts a bit longer, like maybe for this one, or it could be an afternoon thing that starts a bit soon. Who knows? But it is quite interesting what these differences are. And I'm only now being able to get enough data together to be able to show these. Anyway, uh, you were going to um, get Steve's feedback on uh... Yeah, if we could just return a little while ago, we had a question from, uh, from Peter. Uh, G4 PNF, it says, what is the significance of the different colours on an ionosond graph? And Steve G0KY, who's the chair of the RSGB Propagation Studies Committee, has come back and said, Jim is correct. On a digisond, red is the ordinary wave data and green is for the extraordinary ray. So there we are, that's confirmed. Hopefully that's helped you there Peter. Also Steve adds um, a radio wave passing through the ionosphere gets split into ordinary and extraordinary waves by the action of the Earth's magnetic field. So although that's slightly off what we're talking about tonight Peter I hope that's helped you on that question. Um, thank you very much Steve for coming back on that. Um, we've got another couple of or another question at least. Um, I don't know if you'd like that now um, Jim? Well, well I'll just if you can just put up this screen now I'll show you that ionosphere right. oh, with yes. the so, so here's the red line that is the ordinary wave, this red line here, and where that goes up in a vertical way here, that correlates with the FOF2. And um, where you've got your green line going up, that's the extraordinary ray, and that correlates with your, your, your F, FXI, um, and that's uh, 8.42 which is this one here. And it's usually about 0.7 of a megahertz above the FOF2. And you can get propagation between those two frequencies. There's been quite a lot of interesting work um, by folk on Envis propagation. Marcus uh, Walden, has, uh, Waldron has done some work on that, which is very interesting. And he's published stuff in Radcom on it. Um, so you can Google that and have a look at it. And, and then these were the other colors that I think uh, Peter may have been pointing towards and and these are I think to do with returns from off vertical and they're color coded now where these colors then appear on here I'm not quite sure so so you need to talk to people who are who are experts in ionosons to get to that but but th there's a load of stuff online about interpreting ionosons but actually I have to say it's quite, it's quite a, a skill. It's a very complex thing to interpret them. And in the old days, they used to be done by hand, by eye, so to speak. And, and it would take quite a while to analyze a return. And, and I doubt you'd have the frequent sort of 10 minute interval readings that you get now, you know. And uh, so, so we've moved on a long way. But the cost of that has been automating it, which means sometimes the automated processes don't um, have a success and and they come up with with does not compute you know can't come up with an answer and I think the auto bit is shown in the bottom left here by something called auto artist five which is the very the um, version number of the software being used to decode it some radio songs you'll see have artist four down there which I think tells you which which version of software and people in the know who 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 deal with the dotting I's and crossing T's of this stuff uh, will be acutely aware of the differences between them and the differences between these and hand um, analyzed or eye analyzed uh, ionosons. 
Right. OK. okay well, thank you very so, much for that. Hopefully that's helped you, Peter. If you do still need further information, as uh, Jim said, if you look online or if you want, uh, we can put you directly in touch with uh, Steve at the, of the uh, Propagation Standards Committee. Anyway, Jim. Back yeah. To you. So, so okay. So um, there, there we had our double peak for the averages. What happens when you do the averaging? Now I'm going to go on to. Uh, we've got these two tabs to do here. So the ease blog is what first started me off on tinkering with sporadic e, which was relating sporadic as it turned out. Without making this a talk about ease per se, um, there, there's a very strong link between jet streams and ease because um, sporadic E is very localized. And if it was a big earth physics sort of type of thing or space physics type of thing, it would happen over a whole hemisphere. So, so if it was to do with sun's input or tides and things like that, there wouldn't be any reason why E's happened in one place and not another, uh, in, in sort of within Europe, say. So there had to be something which, which gave it some focus. And the thing was, um, I started looking at ease in relation to um, upper air charts. And I started to um, investigate what happens when you look at an upper air chart. And this is a bit more than an ordinary upper air chart. So, so if I just spend a brief moment or two, this is all described in the about section. but. Basically, the green meandering string of, of color there, that's the jet stream. And the density of the green, or even in the best case, is the yellow up here in the top left, you'll see is stronger winds. So, so you'd be looking at jet streams to be regions where there might be turbulence generated in the weather bit. Remember our logarithmic scale images we had at the beginning, low down. Well, somehow or other, you've got to get that information up to the E layer, which is 100 kilometers plus. And what happens is the turbulence down here where the weather is, and in particular jet streams, can propagate upwards. It's like ripples in a pond on the side propagating upwards through the air. So air is, you think of it as a fluid. Anyway, what, what it does is it interacts with stuff going on in the E region. So this is how the weather can communicate with, with the ionosphere and um, a whole subset of, of research and um, interest has, has, has evolved around these sorts of things, which gets the tag of space weather. Uh, and it is, you know, that the atmosphere around the globe is linked. It, you know, everything is joined up. It's all part of one and the same thing. Um, so there's no bit that operates truly independently of all the other stuff. So, so as it happens, it's been discovered over the years that jet streams correlate really well with where sporadic E happens. And the, the thing that I've been interested in is in particular, whether it's one bit of a jet stream, whether it's the end of it or the beginning of it. So there's a little segment here that comes in across Northeast England, across uh, Denmark, North Germany, and up into uh, the Baltic. Now, uh, it could be anywhere along there. I don't have enough data at the moment to know uh, where I'd prefer, but what I have noticed is you tend to get uh, a, you tend to get an improved chance of sporadic E either in the strong core. There's a little hint of yellow in that core there. So where the strongest winds are, the strongest turbulence at the entrance to the jet stream, where air is accelerating in, it's like whooshing down an arrow pipe, and at the exit of the jet stream, where it's coming out and just spreading out. And, and those are areas, three areas where you could get enhanced turbulence. The, the other thing that sprung up was to do with how quickly the pattern is changing. Now, the jet stream winds, these green shadings here, are determined by the closeness of the, what in the real world at the surface you'd call isobars on a TV weather map. In the upper atmosphere, we call them contour heights. So you measure the height of a fixed pressure. I uh, won't go into that now, but it is what we do on upper air charts. And think of them as isobars and showing strength is the closeness together of them. So if the pattern is moving quickly, then you'll get rapid changes in where these isobars are and the tendency for more turbulence. So where the values of these contours, 
is falling rapidly, you get these red lines surrounding it. And where it's increasing rapidly, you get blue lines. So where you've got big contrast going on, rapid changes, you're more likely to get turbulence. So you would expect something to be happening here, possibly, and here. Um, now, what causes these rapid changes could be the pattern itself moving. So if it's moving quickly, there'll be big changes at an instant, because this is the time up here in the top right says it's 1800. So at an instant, there will be rapid changes because either it's moving quickly and this is the snapshot of where it is, or it could be because the thing is developing. So the low is getting deeper, it's getting bigger. So there's all sorts of turbulence and exchange of energy and, and airflow going on that's quite chaotic and could generate these, these ripples, these gravity waves in the atmosphere. Uh, so anyway, that's what these colored lines are. And then we've got these little magenta or orange colored blobs, which is where the models are predicting severe thunderstorms. You know, the ones that we've seen recently in this country, but also that caused uh, a lot of flash flooding in Europe. Uh, some of those big storms are known to generate turbulence and gravity waves as well. And there's another chart, which I haven't got on here, but um, I use to create um, some background knowledge is vorticity and you know a vortex it's spin so it's how much spin there is in the atmosphere at any one place and you can get spin in the middle of a low like there's a little upper low here so there's a lot of vorticity there but you can also get spin on the edge of a jet stream because in the jet stream the air is flowing quickly down here and not very quickly here so this bit is going quicker than that bit and if you put a stick in the water across there like that this bit would go quicker so it tend to tilt so that's giving it spin so so vorticity is quite an important parameter in atmospheric physics and it may be something to do with where the turbulence is more likely to be generating these gravity waves that make heat so so in in other words this business about forecasting sporadic e and explaining why it happens where it happens is very complex and and if these atmospheric triggers help us to get some locational insight then it's worth spending a bit of time trying to um, understand them over long periods and i've been doing this for well since the late 80s and and if i had to put money on it i'd still feel that jet streams were one of the key locational parameters what, one of the here and now parameters of why it's today and and not yesterday and so on is is tied up very strongly with meteor input because sporadic E is composed of ionization from meteors as they burn up, as they enter the atmosphere. And that ionization gets compressed up there into these thin layers that uh, make sporadic E. Uh, anyway, so, so, so where these jet streams are is really important. Uh, and, and the interesting thing is, quite wide zones of jet streams can affect large bits of the continent at any one time. And these two black circles here represent typical range for a mid distance of a sporadic E path into Europe. So if you get a jet stream uh, or anything exciting happening within these two lines, that's a pretty good direction to look. So from here, we'll be looking into, into Poland and uh, uh, Belarus and Western Russia and Northern Ukraine, so across that bit. And, and you could put together thoughts about multiple hops and you could have another hop possibly using this subtropical jet stream over Turkey, which is pretty much there most of the summer. Anyway, the, the, the other thing to point out while we're looking at these, and you can look at these off your own bat as well um, when you log on to the website, is that if you look at northern latitudes uh, in the summer, when you've got continuous daylight up there, the weather patterns are changing and the jet streams tend to shift northwards. In, in a typical warm summer. Uh, and, and therefore, you get these jet stream patterns at northern latitudes where you wouldn't normally see them in the winter months. Um, they'd all be a long way south, probably through the Mediterranean, if truth be told. So, so anyway, point is, a lot of these paths that go up over the poles, say from the UK, you beam north, northeast, you're going up here, over there on a circumpolar thing, and down over here to Japan and so on. You're, you're going across what is a wave train of jet stream bits up here as well. So the fact that it's going through a polar region may not mean that it won't be multiple hot bees. It could be, 
or it might be something else. And um, lots of interesting discussions going on at the moment about whether there's 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 ease involved at either end and possibly something else different in the middle and uh, all sorts of things. So that's why propagation is such a fascinating thing. Anyway, so just by clicking on the different um, the different thumbnails here or clicking this arrow here, you can see how the thing changes and you can see this this thing really winding up. This is what's giving us our stormy weather um, in the southwest tonight. OK, so that's the upper air charts, which I use uh, to, to get a good grasp of what's going on there. So let's now go on to this thing. Now, oh, oh there we go. So um, the EPI is, is what I call the ease probability index. And the best thing I can say without this going on in an inordinate no an, a number of hours after this is for you to look at the about section on the EPI. And what it is, it's taking the things that we know about in factoring where ease is most likely based on the things like jet stream strength, um, high ground comes into it a bit, um, time of day. So you'll notice these higher colours, these richer colours. The scale is along the bottom here. And these richer colours come in um, and, and they migrate across the planet. So you can scroll across here and see what's going on in the States and, and you can look at uh, transatlantic paths and so on. And if you put your call sign in here, you can, you can and your locator, uh, you can get your short term stuff. But if you put in a distant location, when you click go again, you can get it to plot a path. The only thing I haven't done yet is sort out uh, how to divide it into multi-hop paths and where those hops would be. But if you put in a path from one side of the States to the other, you could see <coughs> how the ease was, you know, was, oh, and, and also if you click on the map, you can see here there's a very good spot between there and there. Um, actually, we're in the middle of the ocean there, aren't we? So that wouldn't do at all. Let's go there. So, so we're in New York. So going northeast, you'd, you'd think, oh, that would be useful. Uh, anyway, you get the idea. And, and, and ultimately, the aim will be to be able to, um, to put this on and have a look and see um, whether it crosses these, these areas of heightened likelihood of ease. Uh, so, so this PropQuest thing is really a useful tool to experiment with. It's continually being thought about and worked on. There are other things we're looking at, but at the moment, this is where it, it's a bit more than a beta version, but it's not a fully fledged, this is it finished version yet. For example, well, I'll tell you about that in the next section. Um, so, so, so before I leave this bit then, David, I'll take any questions on PropQuest website itself, yeah. and then we'll yeah. do just a little final payoff on, on the things that are happening next. Final, thank you very much, uh, Jim. I'm going to go um, now to uh, Ian, G4SGX, on Facebook. And he says, does PropQuest provide the current SSN numbers suitable for input into vocap or hamcap? Some SSN numbers available online don't seem to be suitable for some reason and not sure why. OK, uh, that I may uh, probably offer back over to Steve um, because... Um, we, we don't put the SSN numbers in on this. Um, there, there is a suspicion that coronal mass ejections and solar activity has some influence on this, but, but it's actually more uh, significant what the KP index is. You'll notice how up here the KP index, the latest reading when we look at it, is one, which is a good thing. Uh, I'll tell you what, let me, let me put... Um, uh, oh, I don't know. Um, uh, let me put K1XX in there. And uh, okay, we'll, we'll go do to that. Have a look at the uh, screen now. Yeah. So I've just put the call sign in just to. Uh, I'm assuming the K1XX is fictitious, but I'm uh, sorry if it isn't. Um, and, and then you can put in a distant one. So supposing I put me in there and I put in uh, my locator square. Um, uh, have I got that in all right? And put that in there. And then you select in these little dots along here which band you're on. 
So let's say we're looking at 50 megs. Then it fills a nice little box down the bottom here with the distance of the path, the time, and the two locators. So you can have a look and see what's going on. Now, if you, the, the next step is going to be to be able to, you could do a screen grab of this. So this button here allows you to copy a screen grab of this screen. So your QSO that you just had across the pond, you can, you can do. What I use this for, for close in local contacts, is I'll take this distance and divide it by half and then make these rings, which you can alter by doing this, uh, make these rings match up with the halfway distance. So you can see whether it correlates with a hotspot for the ease probability. But if you press this, it will then go off and do, and, and it's popped up in there as a, um, as a download. I don't know whether I can get that. Yeah, and it gives it a, uh, so there it is. So you can see, and there's the download. And if I open that up, there it all is. So you've got that as a record. And that's quite useful when, when um, the time comes to review things. But, but you'll see there are several reasons why it might be interesting to look across the pond on, on six metres uh, this evening, you know, after we finish here, because, you know, there are several. The thing about undulating jet streams over the Atlantic is they often make these the succession of points on a great circle path where, OK, the first one's a bit weak, but you never know. This thing might kick something up. So, so there is always a possibility that you can you can put something together. And what we'll do that one of the next developments is to divide this into in, integral number of um, uh, discrete hops and put a cross on it where the midpoint of the hop is. And something that uh, GM I was talking to via email a couple of days back uh, has suggested, which is a great idea. Um, so thanks for that, Martin, is to perhaps have a color code for this red line here that suggests the combined probability of say the whole path. So you get your individual separate pro probabilities from each point where the, where the path intersects with the E region and then factor those together to get a single probability for the path overall and um, color code the line according. Who knows? So there's loads of things you could do with it. It's all quite interesting. Really. Yeah, thank you. Uh, now going back to another question. It's our last question so far anyway. Uh, from Rick M7 GMT. This is part two of his question. Love PropQuest, he says, use it all the time. I often notice the ionosond data drops out for random periods throughout the day. Is this a problem with PropQuest or the ionosond itself? As a web developer, I'm happy to donate some time to investigate this if it helps. Yeah, OK, but that, that's, that's a good question and very kind, uh, uh, always appreciated offers of help. Now, it, it is the system um, that I mentioned a while back about the Ionosons being automated. So software that's operated by the scientists who run these Ionosons um, uh, decodes the data and where it can't determine what the reflection point is. And sometimes it can't, it, honestly, it can't get a value because there's blanketing ease or something. So it chooses not to put an, a value up there that it's not sure about. So there's nothing, it is what it is. It's like, it's like um, I don't know, it's like measuring the depth of water when the river's frozen. You know, you just can't do it. Uh, it, it is what it is, and, and, and that's it. So the dropouts are usually some particular problem that the automated software that decodes the ionosond, which is nothing to do with, with, with us uh, amateurs, it's to do with the system and how it's configured. And I'm not sure you, you could configure it out, if you see what I mean. Uh, but, 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 but anyway, it, it's, it is to be expected, shall we say. Fine. All right. Jim, thank you very much. Um, I think that's uh, almost all our questions. We've just got one point uh, made, really, or a um, bit of information useful from T Tony M0TDK on BATC. And he says, QST, the ARRLs magazine, has an interesting article on space weather in the August edition. Excellent. Oh, well, I'm, I'm a member, so I can have a look at that online and, um, and uh, go and have a look at that. Thanks, Tony. Brilliant. OK, well, what, what I'm going to do is is now I'm going to. And, oh, uh, let me just uh, do this. OK, so uh, if we can go back to my um, 
my slides now. This is, uh, uh, here's one I prepared earlier, which shows, you know, you can get these signatures of ease probability quite high a long way north. So, so don't assume that you can't get, say, signals going across Greenland to the Pacific Northwest uh, via traditional ease methodology, shall we say. But, but the, um, uh, what I was going to, oh, did I do that? Yeah, this was a path when I worked, um, who did I work here? Uh, oh, no, I didn't. This was um, on the cluster. This was a G4OGI who heard the OH96 beacon. So this is on six meters. So we've got that little box blob and that's in there. And I took the half distance and the half distance in this case correlated with this enhanced region. Now, now the, the thing about this is this is early days and you say, well, why wasn't there something here going in that direction? Well, there isn't anybody necessarily on the bands over here to talk to if, if that were active. And it's not every path that gets active just because you see um, you know, a high index, because it could be there's something else here going on. It could have been airflow over the mountains of southern Norway, for example, tipped the balance in this instance. So there's all sorts of um, all sorts of reasons why it might not be the case. But anyway, uh, you can scroll it around and see the, the problem we've got at the moment is the data not scrolling very far to the east. So we, the API using Google Maps doesn't allow us to to move it farther east. So we've got to investigate that or look at using different maps. Anyway, new developments, just as a final piece here. Um, I, I'm looking quite closely at Ionosan data. We're looking at new EPI maps all the time to try and, to try and um, make them better. Uh, I'm also writing, I've started writing some Python programs to do the first item on here and this third item, which is going to be looking at the, the calculated ease probability index, we, we value, put a value against each ionosond location. And then I can look at the ionosonds and see how that compares. And the, the aim is to do a study to see which bit of the EPI determines most closely how the FOEs goes. And so it's, it's a way of verifying it and seeing how it's working and making changes to make it better. So that's an ongoing thing. And then we, we may at some point have to discuss funding. So this is some of the stuff I've been tinkering around with. So uh, if you take data from the Ionosan, remember I showed you two other features, the FOEs, the critical frequency of the E layer, and the height of it. So I've plotted some on here, which is the top graph is for uh, FT8 digital modes, where the height goes up here on the Y axis from 80 kilometers up to 150 and this value here is the FOEs so the stronger the FOEs so the more intensely ionized the layer becomes uh, the more it seems to focus on a fixed fairly narrow height interval now that I've been looking at these during the last two months or so since I finished writing this program and what it shows is that, that taking nominal values for which band is available. Um, for data modes, it can be as high as 10 times. So this would have given us values up to four meters. Um, and, and then for uh, traditional modes like CW, it's um, up to eight times I've seen. And, and this again covers four meters. So, but but the, the point to make is that you tend to find, and it, there have been more marked examples than this. This was only a couple of weeks ago. But, but you can get them where it just comes to a very thin line at about 100 kilometers altitude. So that was interesting. And um, it shows how the things develop over time. And this is another thing that makes it interesting. If you plot these values of the FOEs against time, which is this black graph here, you'll see you get a descending layer of these coming through here and then a new ignore the fact that goes up there it doesn't really go up in height this is a new layer starting which then descends and as it descends the way ease works is as it descends it scoops up all the ionization in that region and compresses it to make a thin layer to make ease happen so you tend to get these more intense shadings six meters and four meters here 
when it's descending cleanly without a lot of zigzagging between multiple uh, uh, layers there. And then it gets a little bit fragmented in the middle of the day. Then we have another go at it in the afternoon and evening. And you can get two or three cycles like this. So, so what this has shown me, and this is just getting data from regular ionosons. And what this has shown me is that um, there aren't just two periods when you can get ease. You know, it's not, okay, for many of the openings, it is a mid-morning thing and a late afternoon and evening thing. But, but there are, as evidenced by these graphs, and I'm working on these at the moment, and we'll come up with some, some uh, analysis of them for next year, which will probably have to say something about how, how it's a combination of many different uh, influences of these, and it all correlates with descending features as a rule. Um, and uh, there's a lot of work still to come out of this, but it's quite fascinating. And this lower graph is color coded version uh, with the colors of the dots suggesting uh, which time you'd expect. I thought I'd find a whole bunch of stuff in these greeny yellows and then a whole bunch of stuff in the purples. And to some extent you do. There's, there's greeny yellowy colors in here. And then there's also some purple stuff going on, which starts higher up and then comes down. So this is the stuff in the evening and it would be correlating with what you're seeing over, over here and, and you know, a bit over there. So it's fascinating. Anyway, lots of work going on. Um, this is something we're experimenting with, with a different map style to be able to, you can just hold it down and twiddle it and you spin the globe and so on. It's a bit like the features you see on satellite tracking programs. The only trouble is, if you put the UK on one limb, you can't quite get over to Japan or Australia on the other. So we've got to do something to expand the plot of the map on the edges. But anyway, that's something we might be looking at. I'm not sure if that will uh, be a keeper or not, but it's an experiment that we're doing. And then this is the thing I wanted to say about the funding. We've been doing uh, the PropQuest for a long, long while, and this goes back to January 2018. And green is PropQuest, yellow is something else. So, so you can see we've just trickled along here with very little activity, just the, the, the keen folk who know about it. And then at the beginning of last season, with a bit more exposure, it got to be a bit more popular, and particularly with, um, with various talks and um, uh, online things, um, you know, it all started to kick up a bit. And then this May, with the... Um, uh, publication of the article in Radcom Plus. There's been a lot more interest. And and this is um, uh, gigabits of bandwidth, about two per day. So it's quite a big ask now for this to be just sort of done as part of what we normally do for the day job. So there may be like a lot of these international websites where you get a lot of usage. Um, and especially if we were going to come up with a model that made it sort of pan-galactic, so to speak, that you could pick up iron songs from anywhere in, in, in the world. I don't think we'd ever be able to do that, but, but certainly a more widespread distribution than now. To do all of those things would require a bit more of a, of a firm footing for the funding. But anyway, um, just to show how popular it's become and that um, people are, um, are starting to use it. We've got to um, always keep ahead, putting new stuff in, making it better, and improving people's experience with it. So it's not, first thing to say, second thing to say, firstly, it's not just about sporadic E. It's about HF conditions and running local nets and NVIS stuff. And it, it's basically yours. It's stuff that happens because of the input from the logs that you people put in. So I think that's, uh, that's where I've got to with it. But thanks for sticking with it for this evening. Um, Goodness, we've, I've taken up a lot of your evening. So apologies for that, but um, happy to answer any questions from anybody who's still awake. Yeah, everybody's still awake, Jim, I can assure you. Um, we have just had Rick M7 GMT uh, just made a comment, could possibly help reduce bandwidth usage with some judicious cash, caching, caching, sorry. Uh, drop yep. me an email. So um, I'll put you in touch, Jim, with Thank his you. email address. And uh, you never know, you might be able to help with that. That's what it's all about, isn't it? Collaborative effort, just like most of the things that go on in our hobby. I think, Indeed. though, that is um, 
all of the questions and the comments and things that we've had though and as it's um, nearly 20 minutes to 10 I think we probably need to wrap up there to let you have an evening as well <laughs> a bit less but uh, Jim thank you very much indeed but we had lots of people great comments and and thank you very much and we've got people as far away as Klaus in uh, Copenhagen who gives us a five and nine OZ1 DTF so hello Hi, to you Klaus especially and also to not quite so far Jock in Scotland 2E0BNI, though maybe, maybe actually is about as far. Uh, he says he's non-stop son up in Scotland. So thanks a lot, Jock. You'll have to come You're back. You're a now. very lucky boy. What goes up must come down. And that applies to you, Jock, all right? So unless you've moved. So anyway. And hailstones. And thanks everybody, everybody else for your questions and comments as well. But um, most especially, Jim, thank you very much to you and your team. And I think it wouldn't be right for us to let you go without mentioning that award that you won both for uh, the, uh, the the PropQuest website and also your work on the development of the Ease Probability Index, the EPI, which of course you share with all of your colleagues, Dan, and all of the other people and the and organisations that share data and things with it. But that was the Les Barkley Memorial Award that you received from the RSGB at their AGM this April. So a wonderful congratulations. We're very proud of you. In fact, I think we've got a picture here which Tammy can bring up without wishing to embarrass you. There we are. That was the, that was the RSGB's <laughs> Facebook post from earlier this year. So if you didn't know about that, uh, it's wonderful. I know you're particularly pleased to receive this award because it was the first award and you particularly hold Les in high regard, I think. Oh yeah, I've got one of his textbooks. And um, it, yes, it's always, it's always nice when the amateur community is recognized for the contribution that it makes to uh, propagation stuff. Our license says it, it's for the self-improvement, doesn't it, yes. somewhere along the way. And, and I think propagation is an area where, not just me, but loads of people can contribute to that. And um, it's, it's great that it's recognised by the RSUB in that way. So um, I'm very, very touched. But it's for all of you because your logs are what made it happen, really. So you're sharing it. But, but thank you Make very much. Make room on the bench. <laughs> <laughs> we will. But thank you, Jim, very much and your team for PropQuest and for what it's giving to our hobby enables us to make the most of conditions almost at any time that's what it's shown so but thank you very much indeed for that and your time last night and this evening as well to jim baker g3 yla all the best thank you thank you very much jim and uh, that's almost it for narc life this week so thanks of course again to jim for his uh, contributions both on the weather of course and as well as about prop quest just to remind you what's happening next week or and in fact this sunday to remind you again that uh, the king's Lynn radio rally is happening uh, to king's Lynn or uh, from nine o'clock this sunday on uh, also later on sunday gb2 rs news at seven o'clock on gb3 nb on monday the 2nd of august the monday night net with steve g3 eva on gb3 nb as well and at half past eight the 80 meter cw net that jim mentioned as well earlier on then and then next wednesday here the 4th of August, we've got Ian White, GM3 SEK, who's going to join us to give us an independent look at the new EMF regulations. That's uh, next week at, at 7.30. Back on Wednesday, we hope, next week at 7.30 as well. But that's about it, isn't it, Tammy? Yeah, I think so. So thank you very much again for joining us both last night and tonight. <laughs> and uh, we, we'll be hopefully trouble-free next Wednesday when we see you then. But from Tammy... Good night. Oh, I might meant to say good night now. Well, you can my say good microphone's night. not up very loud. Ah, there right. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> and from me, David U7RP, take care of yourselves. Good night. Bye bye.